had this great desire for you to finish this book and think, when is she going to write the next one? Welcome to our latest episode of Book Reporter Talks To, where our guest today is Tamron Hall, an Emmy Award-winning television host and executive producer of a syndicated talk show, Tamron Hall, a veteran journalist and a best-selling author. Talk about a little pressure on me right now. We're going to be talking about the second thriller in her Jordan Manning series, Watch Where They Hide. So here we go. And with that intro, welcome, Tamron. So nice to have you here. Oh, so nice to be here with you. What a warm welcome. And thank you so much. I'm excited about Jordan and this latest adventure and just to sit down and chat about it, honestly. You know, it's like once you write the book, you send the book off, you the edits come back, and then it's like this waiting period for the book to come out. Nice. And it's like, yeah. wait, I want to talk about it. I want to talk all about my book. And there's nobody to talk to about it yet because nobody's read it. I'm telling you, you see me, I'm leaning in now on this little camera because I, I'll tell you, it, it's, you know, it's the hurry up and wait. And then suddenly, oh my gosh, it's here. And it's just been whirlwind. I, I, you know, with Jordan Manning, the foundation of both books were cases that I actually covered. Um, two cases for the first book as The Wicked Watch and now Watch Where They High. Um, and so for me, I've kind of had this stewing of emotions and the, the up and down of knowing that while this is fiction and I'm ha I have the opportunity to take us into this world that I've created in my mind, it's really a part of my life and what I did as a crime reporter. So it's like an emotional roller coaster, top to bottom for me. Yeah. And it's something that you clearly had a passion for doing. You clearly love doing it all that time. And it comes forth on the pages because you see the emotion that's going into each case besides just, I've got to solve this. And there's a lot on the line at every moment. You know? Yeah, and I think that's why, you know, for me, that's been the point of pride, if I could actually say that. Uh, you know, I did a show called Deadline Crime for six seasons, and I ended the show um, when I was pregnant with my son after covering one of the cases that inspire this latest um, this latest installment of, of the Jordan Manning series. I left Oklahoma, started writing this case out, and went into the booth to narrate the story for Deadline Crime. And realized that there I was reading about a pregnant woman stabbed 19 times, um, people judging her for a decision that she made that that some within the community felt she put herself in harm's way, you know, that the the judgment of, well, why did it happen to her? Well, this is why it happened to her. And 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 feeling very sad for her and also um her significant other, her husband being the primary suspect. And so this 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 case just left me in such a bad space of just really depression to be quite honest with you. You know, mm -hmm. I'm I'm pregnant and I'm and I'm excited. I'm already uh, what they termed a geriatric pregnancy. I was 48. Mm -hmm. Uh and I'm in there holding my tummy and reading this story thinking to myself there are other people who are reading lullabies and playing, you know, music and Andrea Bocelli or something and I'm reading this. Mm -hmm. And so I decided I didn't want to do the show anymore and I needed a break. And this character though, Jordan Manning started to emerge and she became first an alter ego, right? Mm -hmm. Someone who was going to be able to bust down some doors and, and do some things that I couldn't do. And then she became this friend who's very different from me in many ways, but the foundation and the credibility I feel that she needed and the confidence I needed to write this series had to come from a real space. Yes. And that real space was actually being on the ground and covering these stories. Yeah, and, and you can tell the authenticity. Like you can see that you go into a stumbling block You've got to find the people you can yeah. tell. And you realize it doesn't always happen one, two, three. Sometimes yeah. it's one, two, hang a lot, three, yeah. maybe four, and maybe never yeah. getting to four. And the yeah. depressing thing is never getting to four, you know? It's yeah. And that was the, the enlightening part of, you know, writing a thriller series where I wanted to take the reader along for this ride, but I also wanted to leave them stumped. You know, quite honestly, with this latest book, I wanted uh, the reader to scream at the end and, and just be so frustrated and yeah. so exhilarated at all of these emotional things that we get from a thriller. I wanted... Um, I keep using the word I want, but it's really true. I had this great desire for you to finish this book and think, when is she going to write the next one? Because I, I feel that way. You know, it, it, you you want the, the reader to be present as I was, but I 
I, the last page of the book, I, I, I really felt like, okay, what's next? You know, boo -boo. Yeah, I, was, I was ready, you know, because I, I love hot. It's like, okay, well, you know, and I needed that emotion. But the first, um, honestly, I wrote, we have a, a small cottage on Long Island and that's where we ended up um, being in the, in the pandemic when everything shut down in New York. My son was barely a year old and I started to write this series, the first book, and it had a slow burn to it. And and it, and it was a really gradual introduction to this character that I wanted you to know, but I knew that we had to build her in, in the relationship with the reader, especially thriller um, people who thriller enthusiasts who like this particular genre. The second book, um, my son's now in preschool. I was filming my talk show every day. I'm in the city. I live in a very busy neighborhood in the city. So the heart pounding nature of it mm -hmm. was reflected in this book now where you are I, mean, like, I want I want your like the little whatever this is the jugular thing to be trembling in your body as you're reading this yeah because I'm doing the same thing I'm doing the same thing yeah it's really interesting because um well let's just go back for one second mm. I love where Jordan Manning gets her name from and for anybody who's <laughs> coming in now we've got to do this because I I heard that. I was in an interview with you and I said, oh, this is precious. This is really good. You know? True story. I like fall asleep one night watching, I think ESPN, they had the Michael Jordan, you know, behind the Bulls dynasty. Yeah. And I woke up and I was like, Jordan, her name is Jordan. And then I was like, well, the opposite of Jordan, but the same is Manning. He plays a whole different sport, but they are both, you know, at the top echelon. But I'm convinced I fell asleep, like watching ESPN and I woke up. Jordan Manning was born. And then what to add to it? I'm like, oh, I have a huge collection of Jordan sneakers and people associate me with high heels. But I have, you know, I'd have more if I didn't have two nieces with my same shoe size. <laughs> but I, I, I ended up randomly with probably... I don't know, 50 to 60 pairs of Jordan sneakers. So all around me, Jordan was was like, she was trying to burst out. I just didn't know exactly. And it took me falling asleep to ESPN to find her. That's it. it. Well, I have to admit, New York Giant fan here. I take land to the Mannings. So it's absolutely cool on my part. I'm totally Manning girl. But I think you might be a Cowboys fan. So we might have a little bit of problem there. I know. You know what? Trust me, I... Clearly, I have to be, you know, convicted. There had to be something overwhelming for me not to name her Jordan Aikman or, <laughs> or Jordan Prescott or you know, Jordan Romo, that I right. would go to the Manning and the, the dynasty. But I do love New Orleans and, and their father, a, a giant there and their families, you know, uh, family, the Manning family mean a lot to the folks in, in New Orleans. So it kind of, you know, uh, cross all, all spectrums, if you will. All sports. We can sit there and we can cheer them on. We can cheer on their yeah. show on Monday night nights you know when yeah. it's like so I much fun it. so much I fun you know one of the things that I'm realizing also besides the stories that you worked on through the years that really influenced you there's also the story of your sister who was killed mm -hmm. in 2014 mm -hmm. and her murder remains unsolved mm -hmm. so I feel like always niggling at the back of your mind yeah. is also that it's all the cases you covered mm -hmm. but the case mm -hmm. you couldn't solve and no one could solve really as of yeah. this point yeah. And, her, and her, her death remains an unsolved crime. And for me, you know, I have to tell you, it, it's so fascinating. When I started the show, Deadline Crime, um, the show was born after a conversation about, you know, we want to do something with you. People really like you on MSNBC and NBC, and you've broken down these barriers and things on and today's show. What else do you want to do? And at the time, I, I was really trying to search for another type of show that I could really sink my teeth into. And this person who was talking with me said, you know, tell me about your family. And I started to um, just talk about, well, do you have siblings? And I ended up talking about my work with uh, survivors of domestic violence and that it was uh, the result of my sister's death and this unsolved crime. And so the beginning of deadline crime, when you say, I don't want to know why these crimes, how they happen. I want to know why. Mm -hmm. And that became the, the very intentional introduction to this six season um, uh, show that I did. And so for me, even writing this book, when I thought about, okay, where does Jordan go now? What, what story will bring the reader into her world, her authentic world, truly the, this case in Oklahoma, I just referred to in another case in Michigan, they, they didn't leave me. I mean, obviously my sister's case is always there in a different way, but, but knowing that, 
you know, the case in Michigan, you know, a beloved sister, I spent time with her family and she was like my sister at this point of ending her marriage. And suddenly this, this moment happens uh, in her life. And, and, and it was just, and, and also the, the wanting of justice with my sister, it's an unsolved case with the case in Michigan, her remains weren't found for eight years. And so on this path of where Jordan goes next, while normally, you know, Jordan is the, the alter ego or the person that I identify most with in, in this series, this time it became Shelly. And Shelly is the sister of this missing woman. And Shelly um, feels helpless. I felt helpless and still do in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, angry. Um, I felt that I saw and witnessed things that, you know, uh, made me um, question what more could I do as a sister? Shelly is that same way. She's, mm -hmm. you know, she's, she's suspicious of Marla's husband. She, you know, talks about never liking him and never getting a good feeling about this guy. She's also very close to Marla's child, you know, on my own show, um, one of the most um, difficult episodes of my show uh, was a an episode where my sister's son Leroy joined uh, for Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and he talked about, you know, having to explain to his own child why his grandmother is not around and where is she and will I ever meet my grandmother? And he has to explain in limited terms to a child why he doesn't have a grandmother. So for me, again the writing process, I, if I had to write, I don't know, gosh, if people had approached me about, you know, beauty books in the past. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I don't, I don't even do my own makeup at the show. I don't have, I don't have a point of reference for that. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, I did core book. I, I can do my own home, but I don't know if I can just run in and tell everyone like Martha Stewart, six, you know, tulips on the left. And I don't have that skill set, mm -hmm. but my personal experience and my professional experience put me in rooms, in places for 30 years that gave me um, something to offer Jordan yeah. and the reader in the process. I feel like you had the insight of what were these people actually doing? Because you was taught, you would, you do this 360 look at what's going on. You're talking yeah. to the family, you're looking all around, you're watching the room yeah. and mm -hmm. you're the outside person. So now you're the same thing, but you're like telling the story and yeah. how this is going to come together. And yeah. I, you know, it's also interesting. It's set in 2009. And yes. What was the reason? And I'm guessing some of the yeah. impetus for this, but let me, let me see what you yeah. say. I have to tell you a lot of it was technology based. So my, my friends call me new next now, because if there's a gadget out, I may not know how to operate it, but let me tell you, it's in my Amazon cart and I'm ready to get it with me. And so it was important for this case to not feel so dated. I was telling a friend of mine recently, I was listening to, I don't know, some hip hop song and they made a beeper reference. And I was like, oh my God, beeper. Well, like, does the kid even know what that is? But technology, um, of course, plays a huge role in the way cases are solved today. But in, in this particular case that I covered on Deadline Crime out of Virginia that ultimately ended in Michigan, the, the, the suspect, the killer who was convicted, eventually confessed because he got an Xbox in prison. And I never forgot that. Wow. He received an, they, they bartered an Xbox for him to finally admit it. And it makes me, again, I feel like just nauseous now yeah. reading it, but he also met a, um, a young man online who played a role uh, in his alibi through gaming. And so this, 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 technology was relevant to the storyline, but I didn't want it to sound so archaic, you know, so I needed, and to be honest, 2009, 2008, that's the year I came to the national forefront. You know, that's the year I started on MSNBC and NBC. That was the year Twitter, you know, all of these things. So it's, it's kind of a grounding year for me. And, and one, in some ways, my most confident personally uh, on my professional arc of my life, it's probably the most confident that I was. So I could pour the confidence I felt in 2008 into Jordan, because that's mm -hmm. a great point of reference. It reminds me, you know, and I've never told anybody this story and uh, be very honest with you. I had a very close relationship with Prince. Um, and I remember the first time I went to Paisley Park and I thought this, this it's almost trapped in this time, right? That 
because it, 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 it was fascinating to me that someone so creative and someone so ahead of his peers, you know, and the music that he created, his, his environment was captured in this time. And it was because that was the, the most important time, I think, for him. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. And you go there and you see everything that mattered to him. You see yeah. everything that meant something yeah. to him during that time. You know, mm -hmm. I say that tech advances have made it so hard to be a thriller novelist. I mean, let's get real. Yeah. Yeah. We watch, you, you're in you're in the New York market like I am, okay? You watch the news at night and they say here, and you see like a hat and this part of somebody's oh, face. Ah. He is the person that robbed the store. And the next night they're bringing him in and they've arrested Crazy. him. And Crazy. I'm just there like, between ring cameras and cameras up and down the street, mm -hmm. who thinks they're getting away with anything? But it's always the next night. It's like, and here we found yeah, the person. Yeah. I'm like, well, no, I love it always. It's some family member or friend. They're like, ah, that's so and so. And then there they are. But you know, the funny thing, or not the funny thing, the, the interesting thing though about technology, um, it's made people believe that everything is solved in an instant. You know, think about it. Even, I'll go even more personal in my, my sister's case. I remember I was talking to the detective and we said, you know, what about, you know, DNA is there DNA around? And he said, listen, um, the reality is, is that if it's someone who's had contact with her, let's say they stayed overnight or lived there or whatever, you know, their fibers would be on her. So, so a suspect in close contact with you in, in the case of women, right? And this is with Marla, 75% um, or about 75% of, of the women who are killed, it, it's an intimate partner, someone they came in contact with. So someone's DNA on you doesn't automatically mean they did it. Yeah. And so with, with, with technology, people believe that it's a straight line. Look at Scott Peterson's case. It's back up in the news, right? I mean, how... It's like that could, to many people, not be more clear. Like, here's the straight line. I mean, it was a textbook husband, selfish, having an affair, doesn't want the child, doesn't want to be married anymore. And he takes this disgusting route of ending the marriage this way. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's a part of... Um, of of believing that it's a snap, right? And that's why with this story, um, bringing in a significant other who is a suspect hit close to home, both personally, but, you know, I, I was thinking the other day, how many cases have I covered like similar? And I lost count. I didn't realize how many wow. of these big, and some of them are not the big headlines that, you know, you click on and see it like a Lacey Peterson. Others are smaller cases, but it happen every day. And yes, there's only the ones that you covered on the news. It's only the ones that the news yeah. finds. The news does not find everything that's out there. And yeah. I have to think that when you were doing that show, it's very emotionally draining. Like just mm. to even be a police officer that goes in and yeah. finds a body is draining, you know, to, mm. to, to a degree. And now yeah. this is a different outlet for you. When you're writing, mm. do you sometimes have to pull back, even though it's fiction and say, okay, I got to take a deep mm -hmm. breath here because I'm really yeah, absolutely with my characters. Absolutely. That's why I did not want to write a true crime investigation that was totally based uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in reality of what happened, I, I did that. And that was emotionally, you, know, you feel so conflicted, I swear to you, because I'm sitting in front of a father whose daughter um, in this landmark case had taken her own life. She was coerced into doing so by meeting someone online she thought was a nurse and a friend and a sympathetic ear who turned into just to be a monster, a, a guy pretending uh, to be a nurse and, and told her, like step by step how to take her life. And her father walked in and, you know, we are just connected through grief and crying. But then there's emotion where I, I start to feel selfish, right? I think, how dare I worry about, I mean, get better line to this. I would, I was crying in front of him and I felt horrible. I'm thinking, how can you cry, Tamron? He's lost his child. Why are you crying? Like, I, I felt that I owed him to be stronger. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm sobbing, right? And so with Jordan, I'm able to bring some of those feelings in, but then to your point, pull out. What? Because I, I don't want to relive um, the, the complicated emotions. But, but I do want people to understand, you know, with Jordan, 
I bring in, you know, she's still climbing the ladder of her career and she's got success now. She's a popular reporter and she may even now fill in in the big chair, you know, to be an anchor, which is the dream job. But there's something about the humanity of reporting on the ground that pulls her back to this side. You know, a lot of people don't realize, you know, when you get the call to fill in anchor, you're like, oh, I'm going to fill in. The rating's going to be good. I'm on my way. But in this case, Jordan doesn't feel as connected to the core of who she is, which is a person who's willing to not just be a witness, but a participant in solving this crime. You know, it's so funny because everybody says they want the anchor chair. And mm. I watch the anchor chair and I realize a lot of time the anchor chair is reading. They're reading yeah. off the teleprompter. Don't tell them well, I agree. Don't tell any of them that I just nodded to them. <laughs> but I'm really serious. I'm sitting watching yeah. in the morning. Every once in a while, I'll be able to tune in. And even the news at night, you're reading off a teleprompter. And one time I used to do CBS early morning, like five to seven. I was the five to seven. They call me in to talk about books. And it was really funny how many people watched. I was like, really, you're not sleeping. You're up watching me talk about books. Like, seriously. So we go in and they'd be saying there's a fire and such and such. How do we pronounce it? How are we going to do that phonetically on the screen? How are we going to? And I had this whole different view of somebody exactly saying to you phonetically, you're going to get on the, the, the screen, like this is what you're going to say. Yeah. And I always say, I don't have a teleprompter here. Like I'm reading off like little notes that I've got right. down here, but there's no teleprompter telling me yeah. what to say. And I feel like a lot of times, even those crime shows in the evening, people are talking from their heart about what's going on. Yes, it can be somewhat scripted, but by the same mm. token, it's what happened today. It's yeah. what we yeah. just found out. And you're still yeah. doing yourself. And I think you do such a good job of capturing that in the book. Because she's got to get from X place to B to Y place. It, well, nobody's beaming you there. You're going to have to <laughs> rent the car or get on the plane or get yeah. on the train. Yeah. And you're yeah. going to have to wait. And if the flight's delayed and you've got all this in, yeah. instead of I'm just sitting and I'm watching and I'm reading. Yeah. And I got the feeling Jordan's like, I think this is cooler. I think this yeah. is a lot more fun. Exactly. And want that. Yeah. And that's the, that's where I wanted her, the, the journalism part of this, you know, when I sold this book, um, and I've said this before, I was quite surprised that publishers told me that, you know, a Black female journalist as a protagonist solving crime written by a Black female journalist didn't exist, you know, in this, in this genre of the thriller world. Mm -hmm. And I thought, whoa, there's so many rich anecdotes, you know, her driving to Indiana in this case, you know, Jordan is based in Chicago. I have more miles than Johnny Cash. You know, I've been everywhere, man. And, you know, when you watch a crime series, I was just watching True Detective with Jodie Foster, you see a little driving, but it's like a second, right? You know, Jordan is on the road for hours. And, right. and I so many things and days and nights were spent just on the road going to, you know, I'm in Texas, for example. Yeah, I'm in based in Dallas, Fort Worth. Nothing ever happened near our studio, right? You were driving <laughs> to these small rural towns and you're walking in and it's like, okay, well, here we are. You're looking for the Chamber of Commerce or the courthouse, which in these small towns, as you know, just there's right there. And you're like, oh, there it is. I'm going in here. So I wanted the reader to experience some of that with Jordan, to experience that it's not a commercial break. And suddenly she's in a whole nother area of the relationships with other reporters. And mm -hmm. even also the relationship with allies that you need on the street who keep their ears. It's the detective who's tipping you off. It's, you know, somebody, you know, maybe who, you know, a big thing for me in my career were the guys who listened to the scanners all night. They knew everything. They yeah. knew everything. <laughs> they were everything doing it. And you know, it's interesting when you go out and you go to America, so much mm -hmm. of media is by coastal. And before I started this company 27 years ago, I was at Condé Nast and I did travel the country doing fashion yeah. shows very early in my career. Now, it's really crazy that I have the key to Grand Forks, yeah. North Dakota, because like we were there and they were super excited we were there. I love but, that. But you went and you saw what you were telling people, like as far mm. as like what fashion was, what was actually in the stores, what people were actually wearing and lifestyle. I learned that in the South, we couldn't do events till later yeah. on in the afternoon because everyone was at church. Yeah. You know, really the way things moved. And I feel like in this book, what you're giving us is a sense of the areas as well where mm. you're going in. Is it safe? Can you go in? Yeah. Who can you talk to and feel comfortable? Yeah. 
And yeah. I think that's a big part of it because every journalist is not like, hey, Taryn, great to yeah. see you. Come on in. Let's tell you the story. You know? No, it's not. And there's a there's a you know a suspicion of particularly once you get to the bigger towns, right? Everyone again thinks, oh, this one's just the one who wants to be an anchor one day. She doesn't care. And you're going into the small town and you're talking to the local reporter who has ownership, if you will, over that area. You mm -hmm. know, again, with this being a work of fiction, I'm I'm able to have um, Jordan crossed some lines that normally wouldn't be for the sake of storytelling. So we get to see that, but, but at its core, you know, when she, for example, arrives to the town and making these observations, um, compared to where, and people forget, like I live in New York city, you drive less than an hour outside of New York city. It's very, very different. People mm -hmm. think of New York state. I'm like, New York city is in this, this, this is not the state of New York. And so having the privilege of reporting, uh, in Chicago, also having the privilege of doing deadline crime, which I used to tell people I'd leave MSNBC and I'd take a plane, train, and automobile to get to wherever this particular area was. It does give you a perspective, even though I'm from a very, very small town. We don't have a lot of crime in my town. There's no area that is immune to crime, but we have a, our population is three. So that would mean the crime was committed by me and right off, you know, so it's a very small town. But, but um, having Jordan in this book you know, make this drive and, and her talking through this great transition of life, right? And, and where you're going. I, 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 I quite enjoyed that because it did remind me of those many days and years of being the crime reporter in the car, you know, going with just me and my camera guy. I think yeah. about sometimes, oh my gosh, the dangerous situation. We, oh boy, it had to be before 97. I sound very, oh, before 97, you know, I remember being out with my camera guy, who's still a great friend of mine. And there was a, a rash of uh, church burnings um, in mm -hmm. this area outside of Dallas, Fort Worth. And they were happening in the middle of the night. And we would have to stake out in the car and lay down in the car and wait for the fire department. I'm like, wait a minute, there's someone burning churches. They might come and try to burn us. And we have no, you know, there's no weapon. There's nothing. And and how many of those situations I found myself in. So that's why even with this next book, I've already launched into the third because I just have lived the, you know, a wonderful, fortunate life. But the biggest thing for me and professionally has been this view of the, 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 the beautiful parts of life when people rally around a family who's lost someone or when there is a prosecutor who is determined to find justice, but also, you know, having this view of life that shows just what people are capable of doing, heartbreaking things. And so I get to bring this in um, with, the, with the reader. And I, I love that with Jordan, you're able to follow along. You're able to try to figure it out with her. I love that, you know, on many nights, I would just close my eyes and, and try to smell the air that mm -hmm. she would, would smell, you know, whatever it feels like to her, you know, the, there's a scene where she is in a flea market <clears throat> and she's looking for clues. And if that flea market was a flea market that my, it, it's actually in Texas and she's taken to this flea market and, and we love buying like old stemware, you know, because it just had like, even if it was cheap, it just looked better. You know, it's like no offense to some of the stores now, but it just had a weight to it. And we'd walk through and like I, I we, she loved um, old estate sales and we pull over and, you know, mm -hmm. she'd say, you know, the rich people, they've got good stuff and they're putting up for sale, you know, and, and that's what I was imagining going into uh, this particular um, flea market that she would take me to. And so now the flea market come, becomes a place where Jordan may find much more about this community and much more about Marla who's missing. Right. And it's how little kind of details I can't find the big yeah. story, but I'm going to find yeah. all the details to put together. And I think that's what's so interesting. Yeah. When you sit down to write, do you have the entire story in your head already? Like, are you yeah. all like, I know where I'm going from point. To point. I, I do. I have, I have most of it. I, you know, in this case, you know, we are taking the reader on this journey to get to know Marla. We're not certain what's happened to Marla. And I have to figure out along the way what I want to have happen. I mean, there were about five different endings of what, what really happened to Marla, who did it or who was involved. And I, 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 I changed toward the end because I really wanted to 
prove to the reader that I could get you. Mm -hmm. I could get you going, yeah. right? That That's what I wanted, you know? Um, I know where we all think this is going, but I really, and that was the snap out of it from reality, right? I needed a juicy enough fiction, you know, ending where you recognize that while Jordan is inspired by me, I am planting my flag as a thriller writer, mm -hmm. as, you know, mm -hmm. as a, a novelist. And I, I needed to be able to, have you go, holy crap, what? Wait a minute. What? What? Da, 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 da. Where did I really miss that, that one? <laughs> and I and I needed it for my own, you know, the reason that I set out on this journey with Jordan is because I needed this break from true crime in a way. Mm -hmm. And I needed to still, I guess, keep a foot in the door, but the comfortable way to do it is to make you uncomfortable with a thriller. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> all. I'm gonna make you feel really bad, but I'm gonna make feel you like feel, I'm gonna you know, I'm gonna have you sleeping, you know, not sleeping for the next four hours trying to figure this thing out. Yeah, like, wait, what really what's she doing here right now? Yeah, 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 yeah. I like yeah. the part in the lingerie store, and I'm not gonna give anything away, yeah, but yeah. I really love that too as a clue. It was like great. <laughs> like well, that can I used to work at a place called Night Dressings in Philadelphia, this little lingerie store, and the characters that would come in, and uh, that was a little nod to Night Dressings, which is no longer in business, but you know, we'd have people coming in for all kinds of reasons, <laughs> and so it gave us a little bit of a backdrop, and I could I could describe it um, because to be honest with you, most of everything, all the shopping I do is online now. But I could go into great detail about this shop because I'd worked at this shop before, a version of it before. And it was interesting because they had the paper receipts. You have the paper this, you have, which yeah. we would not have now. Now, it would be, no. oh, we're going to go into the database. And we're yeah, going, yeah, yeah. They're still writing it up. Although some of few of them, but, you know, they're writing up the receipt. And so it's a delicate balance. And, and even now with the, the next Jordan uh, mystery, you know, we will see the, the technology, you know, boosted up. But it was important that, it, the the books still remain relevant to today, you know, mm -hmm. and so we do start to build um, the the audience to understand she's a modern reporter, she's a modern woman. It was important for me to have, you know, there's the scene where um, I say scene because I'm in TV, but there's this yeah. moment where uh, Jordan is, you know, at the flea market, but rushing back for this date, and as this modern woman feeling you know, empowered by what she does, you know, she's Justice Jordan, but now she's going on this date and she's fallen into this trap of the modern woman who doesn't want to appear too modern because everyone is saying, this is why you're still single. You're not, you know, you have to prioritize and you can't go into this date just talking about yourself. You know, you want him to think you're interested in him. Even if your life is more exciting and purposeful, you are trying to find a missing mom, you know? And so it's this interesting scene, uh, but it's important that she, and I say modern, not in the sense of she lives in a big city or mm -hmm. yeah, I, I say in the mindset of the, the complexities of womanhood today, yeah. you know, and, and, and that did not exist necessarily for a journalist 50 years ago as a woman. Well, I do like when she takes the call waiting and then realizes he's still on the line. <laughs> like he hung up. She goes, oh, I guess he up. But she's had this whole long conversation where she hasn't even remembered that she was talking to him. And she's like, oh, I oh. guess he hung up. And then you look at like, oh, I've been on the phone for 15 minutes. <laughs> you know, I guess he really yeah. realized. And that. I wanted, you know, I wanted her to have that, you know, that, that, that imagine your girlfriend calling you and telling you that story, right? And I wanted the reader to imagine Jordan and see her as a friend and your friend would call you and say, well, how did it go? Okay, well, here's, what. so he was on. I told him to hold on. I'm like, you forgot, what are you thinking? You know, you do, do you like this guy or not, right? Yeah, and I love that, you know, her friend, uh, Lizette is getting married and, you know, she's <laughs> fretting over not having a date in, in, in the bride bay. I've been there. I think a lot of people have been there like, oh gosh, I got to go to this thing. So I don't have a plus one. And, and the anxiety, despite, you know, really being a person who um, has a lot going on and cares a lot, she still cares. You know, she's caring about bigger things, this poor woman who's missing, but you know, she's still insecure about going to a wedding by herself. She's insecure about going to the wedding. She knows she's got certainly responsibilities at the wedding. She yeah. wants to make oh, sure boy. she does those. <laughs> uh, uh, one, one funny side is at our wedding, I decided the single people, I was going to try to match up sitting at the table. And one couple got married. 
two couples dated for a while and one couple got married. They met at our wedding. So I just feel like if you, now this is a new responsibility for a bride, you got to sit there and figure out who's going to be good at the table and you sit them next to each other. Do place cards. I love that. That's (laughs) clever. That's a good one. I need to, I need to copy that idea. I like that a lot. It's yours. (laughs) It's yours. I'm letting you do that. But me and my husband, we are reval again. We'll do that. (laughs) Yeah, We'll do that again. We'll do that again. Do you know, um, do you know when you're going to wrap the book, you know exactly where the ending is going to be, or are you playing with a couple of them? Because this one, I feel like really got us. (gasps) Did you know you were going to us at the end or not really? Yeah, that was the goal. No, that was the goal. I don't hundred percent the goal. I, you know, I, I feel as a, um, Real life is a funny thing. There are many gasps and shock and awes every day. And to create um, something, your own world, your own mind, and have the liberty to really like, oh, you think real life is nuts? Let me just try to play around with some things that I, I, so it was a combination of things that I had reported on and experienced. Plus, you know, I, my husband laughs at me. He's always like, what is going on in that mind of yours? I, I love, you know, I'm a sci-fi junkie. I'm, uh, you know, clearly like everyone else, I binge watch. I binge watch a lot of documentaries. I, I just consume a lot of things. And this just became this, it's like, I don't know, like means the exorcist when she has the pea soup, like, nah. I was like, I'm going to just, I just want it all. I, I, I'm so excited to frighten people. Okay, her job is to find stories, but it's also to spark ratings. And yes. Justice Jordan, I mean, the whole thing in broadcast that people don't really realize is it's about the ratings. It's to get the yeah. story for the ratings. And yeah. there's a lot of pressure on her to not only solve what's going on, but to find the story that people are actually going to yeah. care about. Like, the, yeah. like, which one's going to draw them in and they're going to care. And that's why in this case, I was very intentional. You know, um, one of the the... the when the book came out last, uh, the first book, I remember, you know, someone called me and they said, oh, wow, you made, you know, one of the top lists there. And it was under black books. And I said, wait a minute. Well, wait, what? that's weird. And because this is a story of a journalist, right? She's a journalist who happens to be black, but I, as a journalist, I didn't get to walk into the newsrooms that I've been able to work in and say, ah, I only want to cover the people that I cover. Now, different things hit an emotional touchstone, right? We are our backgrounds, we are who we are. But I I was kind of bummed by it, to be honest with you, because I said, Jordan is this person who's rooting for everyone. I'm unapologetic. Mm-hmm. I'm proud of who I am. I'm a black Southern woman who, you know, dad was in the military, but at the end of the day, I'm a reporter. So with this second case, it was, I was, it was very front of mind, um, the two cases. And they obviously happened to be two cases where based in truth, both were white, but, but, I was eager to put that on, on, on the pages and make it very clear that as a reporter, as Justice Jordan, this is about justice. Mm-hmm. You know, this is about finding the right that in this wrong that's happened to this family. And, and so for me, that's the job that I did with deadline crime. You know, they would give me a file and unless it was a hate crime, I would often not know the person's identity. I would start reading the story and reading who they are and where they are from and and all of those things that matter. So um, with, with Justin, Justice Jordan, she's now become this ally in the minds of people. And she is in this scene, in this conversation where she has with her news director, because this is a missing white woman, you know, she's asked, oh, so now are you falling for the missing white woman? You're trying to get a headline because the person who's missing is white. This is the term that the legendary journalist Gwen Eiffel coined because there is a media, even to this day, obsession, as we see, with not just white, but certain socioeconomics. You know, I tell people all the time when they say white, black, I say, oh, but you even go deeper it's often not just a person who happens to be white, but it's of affluence, right? Because socioeconomically, the case that I covered in Oklahoma, this poor woman who was brutally murdered, she lived in a trailer in the back of her mother-in-law's trailer, you know, and decided to go online to um, prostitute herself for money to make ends meet and fell into the hands of this murderer, this serial killer, right? And to some people, because of her socioeconomic background, yeah, well, what was she doing out there? Right. So it, it taps into many areas. And I wanted Jordan to um, show that a good reporter 
sees humanity. Mm-hmm. And in the first case, of course, being an African-American reporter and seeing, you know, these young black girls who look like her or look like her nieces or they have familiarity um, was important. But in this case with Marla and, and Shelly, she, you know, Jordan sees this relationship of of sisterhood and a family and 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 she wants to bring peace to this this sister who is restless and 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 feels alone quite honestly and that those are the things that um make Jordan not only I think in my mind a character that I hope people will root for and fall in love with, but you'll see yourself in her. I think most people want what's right and they would, if given the chance, get in there to find it. Mm -hmm. And you know what? And it can't be told in a very short period of time. It's got to be longer. And you know, it also goes with your show. I know that viewers and those who are being interviewed on your show love that the segments are long. It's not this three second bite. It's not this five second bite of like, here's here's answer, answer these five trivia questions, blah, blah, blah. Instead, it's let's really get into and that lean in kind of a moment. And I feel like you have that in you. Like there's certain people who want to lean in on other people's lives. And there are other people who just want to tell the story they want to tell. And I've gotten the feeling from you, from reading this book, from reading about you, that's where you want to be. You want to be in there. You want to be in there. Yeah, I do. I really do. You know, I think our show now five seasons in Mm -hmm. uh, came as a surprise to a lot of people because, you know, everyone's like, talk shows are dead. No one watches talk shows. And and to your point, when I pitched the show, they were like, oh, nobody. Everyone's wanting five minute videos. No one will sit for an entire conversation. And I, I never believed that. And I still don't. Um, I believe that if it's a good conversation, we'll stay, you know, and people have done so and do so. And I, and I'm happy about that. Um, but yeah, I, that's just my personality. You know, I, I am a, I, I, I like long dinners at my home. I, I like, um, as you can see, I'm a long-winded person. My mother reminds me all the time. Your answers when you're doing these interviews. I'm like, I get guys. I, I, I enjoy just, I I really enjoy getting to know people. Mm-hmm. I do. And I've always been that way. Always. Well, you know, it, it's interesting too, because so many times people say, how long is the interview going to be? And I said, till it's over. I said, because yeah. there are too many soundbite things in life. And I really like people to be able to talk about their book. And sometimes you're getting something 20 or 40 minutes in that you wouldn't have had yeah. back at the yeah. beginning. So I agree. Who sees your work when you finish it? Who does it go first to? Your agent? Who goes, who reads first? Um, Well, Sean Taylor is my collaborator because I write with this thing that's in my hand. Um, And I, she cleans all of these thoughts up for me. And much of it is, you know, I, 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 for some reason I'm inspired in the shower a lot. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the shower and something comes to mind and I'm like, oh, that's, and I'm like, there are all these wet footprints. Luckily I don't slip and I'm like, and I jump back in the shower, you know, or this story gets in. And so Sean receives my voice notes, uh, which are very long. So we have this huge file and she, you know, dictates them down. And then I go back and look at them. And, oh, that doesn't make sense. Okay. And then she'll clean it up, send it back. If there are specifics, um, you know, Google on um, map like Rensselaer. Like I needed to see what Rensselaer looked like and right. and get an idea of where this this community is. And 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 then it goes straight to uh our publisher from there and and like, okay, we'll take a look at it and everyone gets notes. But I, I hold things close to the vest for a minute because I need to change once it's out of this little gadget here and on paper, I'm able to sit with it. I do um write probably like a TV show, even a talk show, because everything that's on paper, I read out loud. Mm -hmm. So I read everything out loud and I read it as if I'm doing the newscast. So if you are following Jordan in the dialogue, you see that it sounds a lot like I'm reporting to you. That's my particular style because that's my particular weapon. I know how to write a newscast. So this becomes this long version of of what I'm used to doing and how I'm used to um, sharing content with the the reader or the listener. You know what's interesting too is audiobooks have exploded. It used to be that the audio rights were like your rights to Finland. Nobody really cared. And now it's so important. And I've said to a lot of authors, do you read your book out loud? And do you hear that you're repeating the same word, which you may hear yeah. reading it that you'll never see on the page? Yeah. Or what's yeah. the cadence sounding like? Or what's it feeling like? 
And audio and the way people listen these days has changed so dramatically that it's almost something you do need to think about. You know, I wanted to read my book and do the audio for my book. And I will on my third. Um, I was told, you know, the first one, you know, and then the second one, ah, and I'm going, it's my next chapter, take a stand. Uh, I, 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 I have a distinct voice, unfortunately, unfortunately to some, um, and much of it, I wanted you to imagine if you're familiar with my work, especially, and, and if you're familiar with me, I wanted my voice to be the voice that you hear delivering these pages. So that's yeah. the next goal. And the first, the same person narrates the first book and the second book. So anybody who's listening yeah. to this and she's yeah. really, she's very good. She's wonderful. But, no, I, I picked her. I picked yeah. her uh, because I, I, wanted someone who reminded me of myself because of the connection that I'm fortunate to have with a TV show and people are familiar with my voice. Yeah. Yeah. It's like really, really good. Did writing get any easier with book two and book three? Does it um, oh, I, don't to do this now. I don't know if it got easier. I, I felt a bit more pressure again to, to really meet that thriller threshold of really suspenseful. Um, and because this is, you know, again, from, real experiences taking the, the 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 luxuries of fiction right I, I I was like you got you got this whole thing you can go man go and so that was freeing the journalist like you know just kind of go okay girl you're a journalist let it go now you're in this world let's do it so no, that was the hardest part it's just much like when I entered the talk show world um you know releasing you know this strident journalist that I'd been for so long and, and, you know, and, 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 and folding in myself. Right. And so now it's releasing the true crime reporter and folding in the liberties you have when it's a work of fiction. Right. And having a conversation and being able to mm-hmm. talk and have it, about yeah. things instead of just exactly. reporting it out, yeah. reporting it out. Exactly. exactly. So, okay. Now on one pages on the chapter heads, I don't know if anybody's gonna be able to see this. There's a stiletto shoe here. Yes. Yes, okay. indeed, indeed. Now, whose idea was that? <laughs> well, it was a, so the Jordan talks a lot about, my publisher, Jordan talks a lot about her feet because again, one of these little tidbits, your reporter, the guy reporter gets to walk around in sneakers or sketchers or comfortable shoes. You're in what you thought were sensible pumps when you left home. And now you're five hours in front of this crime scene and you're like, this was not a good idea. And so it's kind of this cheeky way to uh, uh, to bring the realities of female reporters. You know, it's like, you know, you spend more money on the way you look, more clothes and wait for it. You find yourself stuck in these shoes that you thought were so cool and I'm going to wear my sensible pumps and there's no such thing. So that was a little love letter to that. Yeah, and as she's leaving the wedding, she's feeling exactly the same thing. Those shoes the were the same way. And it's the common so thread. Anymore. It's not the so common anymore. thread of us all. How about the title? Was this the title always? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That always. Was always the title. I always wanted, you know, because she lives in a in a box in TV. Yeah. And um, as the Wicked Watch was, you know, back to oftentimes you hear that the killer is somewhere around, that they are able to, you know, that they've come back to the crime scene to revel in the destruction or what they've done and then watch where they hide, you know, knowing that this was a woman who may be the victim of someone that she loves. Where do these bad people hide? And, you know, it's just a lot. And 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 now people are watching Jordan more, you know, and, and she's accessible. So it's all a play um, on this, this landscape of Jordan's life, which is television. Yeah. And it's hiding in like real, real space. It's hiding. Yeah. But yeah. It's hiding. hiding but, da, you, da, da, da. But, but how quickly are you able to see it or will you ever see it? So what's it like being on the other side of the desk talking about your writing? Okay. So for years, okay, you were doing, you were doing on the anchor, you were doing reporting and now it's, how's your book? And it's a different yeah. story, isn't it? <laughs> It is. It's so, you know, but it, it, you know, the show, I'm so happy. My talk show is where it is and we're in a comfortable space with anything you can get into a routine, right? Mm-hmm. It's a little harder when you're a journalist, even a talk show host, because we can have, we're live three days a week. So there are days, I can't make up life, right? When you're a journalist, you can, you go in, you get your assignment, you can't make it up. So the day becomes the day. But I, um, for me, 
this breaks up life a little bit. It's much like having a disruptive four-year-old waiting on the other side of that door. It, it, you know, it disrupts what is usual. It disrupts what you believe to be orderly. Right. And, and that's why it's fun. Uh, and it actually, uh, helps me hone in on my interview skills because I get to, you know, see how it feels. And, and it, it definitely, um, in promoting this book, um, reminds me of things. And and I, I've talked to my team. I've got a phenomenal team of producers. And then sometimes I'll say, see, people can hear when you know, and you've read and you've been in touch and, mm -hmm. and you know what you're talking about. And I can tell when people have read the book or mm -hmm. just read the end, you know, you, you can tell. And, and that's why it's so important that when we're producing the show that we watch the movies, we read as much of the book as possible because the, the person on the receiving end can often detect that. Yeah. Or I've just seen. be curious, even if you haven't read it. I, I you can detect curiosity and those right. are things that are important. I always fold down pages and then I go back later and I don't write why I fold down the page. And then oh. I go back later because it may not matter later. It may have only mattered in that moment. So you may get the answer to what's ever on folded down page yeah. later that here. I like that. That's a good tip. I just fold them down and go through all the pages. And then that's I like that the question. Yeah. Great tip. I like that. Tamara, it's been a pleasure. I look forward to the third book. Really ah! look forward to seeing what, what happens next Thank with you. this woman. You know? Oh boy. Wait I until you, you see shoes lot. somewhere along the way. <laughs> I, you know, we got to work on this because the shoe thing, I can't continue it. Even now, like, I'll tell you, look, Jordan Manning, not today. <laughs> it might be a good thing that that's what she's starting a trend in. Because let's, I like let's, it. when you're doing stand up, it's from here up on, you know, on the street. They're not shooting your feet. You know, I'm telling you, she's got to make some change in this woman's life. But we I appreciate you so, so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. And thanks for dealing with the little guys on the other side. It, I hope it didn't disturb it, too much. It always happens. It always happens. Oh, it, it's real yeah. life. That's why it's, it's real life. <laughs> Amen. Well, thank you. I can't wait to talk again. Okay. Thank you so much for okay. your time.